All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming to uh, this workshop on uh, the issues of local content, inclusion and representation, strategies to enable and make sustainable local content. Um, I'm Bertrand Moulier, I'll be the moderator, and I'm uh, delighted to present our four scintillating speakers. To my right here, Sarita Alakani from One Fine Day Films. Next to her, Vanessa Sinden from Triggerfish Animation in South Africa. Next to her, Sigrun Neissen from Deutsche Welle Akademie. And last but certainly not least, <laughs> Santiago Schuster Vergara, who is currently a professor of law at the University of Chile in Santiago de Chile, but also was one of the the heroes of the construction of the licensing system for musicians in Latin America, and I mean this uh, directly. Also want to introduce Victor Wade, who's going to be our online moderator. Thank you for your help. Um, we have a bit less than 90 minutes now to cover quite a lot of issues. This is a workshop, not a seminar or a conference, and therefore we thought that what might be an opposite. Oops, this is not moving. Can I have the next slide? Um, would be to really make, oops, there's something missing there, never mind, to make sure that you have, um, you have a chance to really hear from working professionals in the professional audiovisual and music content industries, what are the issues that these people face every day in terms of developing, producing, financing, and accessing distribution networks for Culturally, re culturally relevant local content. The, we're going to make it very case studies rich, stay away from theory and high, uh, high flying policy considerations, but I will be asking our speakers about what they think their needs are in terms of enabling regulatory environment and incentives and so on to move closer to sustainability, economic and social, of local content. I want to stress that these are not, we're not giving you the full panoply of situations regarding local content. It's an illustration of some of the issues that face the, the professional creative industries in some parts of the world. So we're not pretending to be exhaustive, but we pretended to be powerfully illustrative, I think, of various scenarios and dilemmas that, that occur in the um, uh, very perilous task of developing and producing and disseminating local content. So without further ado, here I, I think you can read, so I won't read them for you. These are the policy questions that I suppose the workshop is asking of itself, which means not just our speakers, but also you here as participants with a lot of things to say. I'll make sure we build in sufficient time for questions and answers and points to be made by you as participants, bearing in mind the inclusiveness of IGF, which is one of its strong points. But, as I said, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Vanessa Sinden, who's going to take you through a very helpfully, I think, just not just uh, material about who Triggerfish are and what they're trying to do in Southern Africa and the rest of Africa, uh, with the very complex business of producing locally relevant animation, uh, but she also t says things that are more generic and very usefully so about the value chain in audiovisual for professional content and the difficulties involved in trying to place that content within that value chain, bearing in mind the, the drastic evolution, and this is where the connection occurs with the internet, that we are seeing now this uh, supercharged distribution system in the shape of the broadband internet and the services that have arisen from that infrastructure. So how does that affect her business in terms of developing, financing, producing, and distributing animated features and shorts and television series? She's going to show you this and also talk, I think, a little bit about her role in helping uh, African creators develop uh, local content in the animated aesthetics and format and especially women uh, across Africa through a, a, a project called um, Triggerfish Story Lab, I think. So, away. Thank you. Thank you, Bertrand. Hi, everybody, and thank you for attending this session. Um, 
and thank you for the partners of the session. It's great to be here. Um, I'm all the way from Cape Town, South Africa, and um, but proudly African, and love absolutely love enabling local content. That's really the focus of the session today. And um, I've been film producing for about 20 years, and 13 of those years I've been focused in the animation space. Um, and most um, relevant for this conversation is with Triggerfish for the last 11 years. I've got some slides as well, so it's so much better than seeing myself on screen. Mm -hmm. um, Triggerfish Animation is an independent animation studio, and um, we've been around for about 22 years, very much focused on creating our own content, African content that would travel the world. Could I just get the slides on screen? Please, thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to be using visuals quite a lot because I think it just helps uh, bring context to the conversation. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of the studio. We are Africa's leading animation studio. Two of our feature films, while I've been at the studio, that I've produced are still two of the top five African films that have ever been produced, and that's global box office success. Um, the first one being Zambezia was the very first animated film I produced, as well as the studio, a CG film. And I love the African, um, the African tenacity that when you go into a project, it's like we've never done this before. But what could what could be so tough? Like, um, you know, how bad could it be? And with a lot of ambition and vision and a little bit of stupidity, we made Africa's. Um, First uh, big box office release that was done in stereoscopic 3D as well, you know, throw in another challenge while we're at it. And it was a huge success. This film traveled to over 150 countries, was dubbed in over 27 languages, and is still a, a wonderful picture of what African filmmaking in the animation space looks like. We followed this off with Kumba. Um, and, and both of these films are really heartwarming African stories. Um, you'll find that African stories tend to be quite somber and deep and, and moving because of our history across the continent. But um, and and these these films speak to that as well. Kumba was proudly dubbed into not only English but two other official South African languages. We have eleven, um, and that's quite small compared to the continent. Um, and this. These, both these films are award-winning and have traveled worldwide. Our, our model is very much taking African stories to the world, um, as opposed to making content for Africa. We find that in the, the space of um, cinematic releases, only 4% of Africa are consuming our films. And we, as a business model, we have to stick to what's going to bring in money to pay back our investors. So. Um, we're very fo much focused on what's going to work internationally, which means our stories have to be universal and, and children in New York to Israel to Ghana need to be able to love and fall in love with our characters and that's what drives our story making. Um, we had a little bit of a gap where we decided to do some BBC specials, which was a, a, such a joy because these are the TV specials that we see at Christmas time. Stickman is in the Graffalo family, Revolting Rhymes won didn't win, we'll win soon. We got an Oscar nomination two years for this film. There were two shorts, um, we'll win that Oscar soon. Um, but this was a proudly, pro proudly Berlin and proudly Cape Town um, co-production. Um, the Highway Rats, Belly Flop, a short that's been screened twice at the IGF already um, with a female director. Um, Zog is another Christmas short, and all of these have been produced locally in Africa, in South Africa, and distributed worldwide. Uh, so as I've mentioned, our model is about is about creating and enabling local artists to create and giving them space to do that. The focus, though, is enabling local content growth. And what I'd love to do is just paint a little bit of a picture of what the current market looks like in these various business models, just to, to give you an idea of what we're up against. And that takes us into the business side of... of um, of this session, but let's quickly take a look at these slides are moving faster than me. Um, in order to enable local content, um, it really means about the local industry is growing, flourishing, people have work, um, it's exciting, it's vibrant, we're creating our own content. That really is what a growing, healthy industry looks like. Um, when it comes to access for all, this is really where our studio not only can just produce content, but we have to make sure that the artists who are working in our studio represent diverse cultures, who represent previously unrepresented people groups. And for us, that's quite important because we start from um, secondary high school level and we provide um, online resources. What is it like to have a career in, in animation? The parent persuasion 
kit because most parents go like, you're, you're going to be an artist, you're going to be a filmmaker, are you nuts? Um, and what we're trying to do is to provide content, uh, information and content to potential um, artists wanting to move into animation to say this is what it looks like. There's free online education, it's a part of our Triggerfish Academy. And why I'm sharing all of this is because you can't just have a healthy um, business making content, you actually have to, to be more organic about the full picture. There are huge gaps between access for all, content online for, for, for African filmmakers. Education is expensive, and so we have traditional scholarships and bursaries, but we also have free online courses because we've, we know that if um, you don't have the money to go to, to Varsity, you're certainly going to try and learn online. I did that for my graphic design course. Um, Many, many African animators and artists have learned and are self-taught. And I love that um, about emerging markets where it, the, the, the materials online, we're going to teach ourselves. And so we've, as an industry, South African animation industry, as Triggerfish, need to make sure that information is online and that it's accessible to all. And then as a, as a, a vital part of the industry, we spot so many gaps. Um, what we see is a lot of talent in Africa, but we see huge disconnect to the opportunities, to the investors, to the, the know-how, to the pitch readiness, to the workshops. And so what we do is bridge a couple of gaps in that area as well. And I'll go into more detail on that in a second. But I'd love to just give you a sense of the business landscape because it is tough out there. As an African producer, we are up against the world. We, um, as South Africans, we don't have state support to like the French animation model where we can create for creativity's sake. We have to create in order to pay the investors back. And, and sometimes you need to create just to find your feet, but we don't have a lot of room for that. What we need to do is create a, um, an industry where a lot of that is happening already, but an artist feel supported and confident to create. <coughs> we, at the moment, are very focused on cinematic release and, and what that typically looks like. You've got an animated film, it's 90 minutes, you release worldwide, you find your distribution model, your sales agent is based somewhere in the world, and they open up the world and territories for you. And you then hope that they will, through their distributors, book as many uh, movie theaters as possible and your film needs to be marketed and hopefully thousands and thousands and millions of um, uh, tickets are bought and bums on seats. That is a traditional cinematic release. This um, model shows in the center your major studios and your major stakeholders in the cinematic traditional model. Um, this does need to be updated a little, but it does show you quite quickly who the major players are on the circle just around that are your mini majors, and in the far outskirts with all the shiny stars are all your independent filmmakers. And what we find is that the, the, the key inner circle of the major studios are pulling in 75% of box office revenue, but 75% of the content being produced is typically the independent filmmakers in the outer circle and are only reaping 14% possibly of box office income. So there's a, there's a very this is a traditional model. It just is, needs to be challenged and disrupted. Um, and it is very hard to make a film in this space as an African and compete worldwide um, and pay your investors back and keep your studio going and the lights on and the, the salaries paid. It's a challenge. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail because I'm not sure of the audience, um, but as an African animation studio, this is typical for us where we need this big tier, this big chain of people to help us get that movie on the big screen with all those bums and seats. And as creators, we're sort of at the bottom tier. As producers, we're at the bottom. We need financiers to help us make this film. Um, we have a sales agent who helps us find those regions and territories. And they will then reach out to distribution so that the, f the film gets played around the world from Russia to China to the US um, to Brazil. And then there's all these different, either theatrical or home entertainment. And what you can see there is quite a lot of people By earning <coughs> quite a lot of money. By theatrical, you mean cinema? Cinema, a cinematic to, or theatrical, going to the theater to watch um, the latest Frozen 2. Um, and what you see is a whole lot of people who are charging 20 to 30%, who are taking huge markups, 50% exhibitor fees. I won't go into too much detail, and, and you're welcome to ask me questions. Um, but what that really shows is, as, as a South African independent studio, we often walk away with very little profits, and on our first two films, hardly anything. And that does make us question, gosh, is this a viable way to make a film? Um, you know, 
if you're not supported by state or, or, or sugar daddy, you really are in a tough spot where you struggle to make ends meet. Um, and, and that does seem challenging, and it does, certainly challenges the cinematic theatrical release model, which is very much held um, and very much favors the, the major studios. Um, I'd love to just t to touch on linear TV, and that's just typical broadcast. That's your, in South Africa, we have the SABC, sorry about that, the SABC abroad, you have your typical BBCs and every other C. Um, the TV series model is a little simpler and a little less people involved. Typically, the broadcaster, the SABC, says to us, Triggerfish, we'd love to um, commission a TV series, we'll pay for it, we'll cover the production budget, and they would have the benefit of um, having it air and doing what they want with it, they buy the rights. Um, the real money in this model is actually your off-screen um, money related to a consumer strategy. So if it's Peppa Pig we're talking about, gosh, you could have a million dollars of, uh, sorry, let's make a billion, because a million's too little, in terms of consumer strategy, um, sales and income. And that's quite phenomenal income when you look at a big TV series. But as an African producer, it's a little bit further f for us than um, your, big, your big companies, um, distributing and licensing companies. In this model, as a producer, we would typically go, great, someone's prepared to pay us to make it. We'll take that deal. And um, then all of a sudden you say goodbye to your TV series and the creators don't have any back end percent. But moving on, we're able to make the TV series and you go ahead and make that show. And that's your typical broadcast model. There think are other models and I'm um, really a fan of the disruption that's been caused with the streaming platforms because typically you'll have a, a Disney Plus or you'll have a Netflix or you'll have the HBO Max. Um, those are the streaming platforms I'm referring to. There's many in um, Africa. There's Iroko TV, which is a very, very much serves a Nigerian local market. And what this means is that local creators are able to create and the streaming platform are paying for the production to, to be made, and if you're in, good at and savvy at negotiating, you'll hope that the creators will will negotiate their percentage of the equity, and that their property would then get the best viewership, and creators will be paid well, and the production will get made. So I'm really loving the disruption in this space at the moment. It makes for very authentic content. In the last five years, I've watched more foreign content than I've ever in my entire life. Hello, this is fantastic. I'm watching Spanish heist movies, series. I'm watching Danish thrillers. You know, it's wonderful. And and to that mix will be African TV series for kids. And it's it's just such an exciting time. And then as filmmakers, a lot of um, possibly speaking to the content creators in this room, you might want to create a film or an animated short but you would love it to travel the festival circuit. And what that really entails, there is no business model, to be honest. You need a sugar daddy um, or a really good state support. But you're creating a film. You need the money to do that. And you need the money to take it to festival. And it'll hopefully win many awards. And you'll make a name for yourself as a filmmaker. There is no business model. And we'd love to be in this space. We've only made one short in the, t in the 11 years I've been with Triggerfish because we just can't afford... We don't have the budget to do it, but we did create Belly Flop, which has been screened at IGF in f four years of downtime in between other films, and we're very proud of it. But it does make for hard, because filmmakers want to be able to create, they want their films to travel, but who supports them? Animation is very expensive. I'm going through this very fast, but hang with me. That's just a little bit of the business landscape, um, but we really want to focus on enabling local content growth. Um, and I'd love to take you through some of the examples that I've been so fortunate and grateful to be a part of. Um, we, I spoke earlier just about how there are these huge disparities between talent and opportunity. And that's um, true throughout the world and in, in emerging, emerging markets. And Africa is one of those. There is so much talent on the continent. Very... Um, very few um, giants in the space who have a have an appetite for risk. And so what, what you find is that th that talent never gets a voice. Flashback to 2015, I was very fortunate to work with the Walt Disney Company, and we launched the first Story Lab f on the continent, Triggerfish and Disney, and we reached out to the continent through advertising and all our different means of social connectedness, and which is which was amazing. And we received 1,400 submissions. Creators saying to us from the continent, "We've got a story for TV. We have a story for features, um, or a short, or whatever it may be." 
pick me, pick me. And we were blown away by the number of submissions. We, 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 we knew we were onto something. African storytelling has just passed on generation to generation. And this is the new platform. It's digital. It's about having your stories told in whatever way you can, traditionally, Hundreds of years ago, it was tribe to tribe. Now it is more digital um, resources. We can do this in a more smart way. What we found was these amazing storytellers. We chose 35 of the best. That was tough. And we brought them to Cape Town for two weeks, intensive workshops. And, and this is a part of that whole thing, again, where there's a skills gap. These creators had never been in this space before, had these great dreams and ideas, um, but didn't know how to get pitch ready, didn't know how to market themselves internationally, didn't know if there were gaps in their storytelling, didn't challenge their character arcs, didn't know how to hook up with a concept artist to get some great animation visuals to life to pitch in, in an international space. And all of this was about, all of the, the masterclass was about putting that support around them, their gaps, Fill those gaps, let's get them to market, and let's see what happens. And um, I'm so grateful to be a part of watching those 35 creators and all the work they're involved in come to life. Some have got works with Turner Group, Disney, Netflix. It's been unbelievable for the continent what's happened through the Story Lab. We basically chose four TV series. Um, the two TV series top left, in the middle we have Ninja Princess, the name has changed, the artwork has changed, but it is still very much a preschool show in development with Disney Junior, and that was proudly a, a proudly African um, TV series, which I'm hoping will go into production next year. The property, the picture on the left-hand side, Mama K's Super 4, is, a, is another of those um, success stories, and this story came out of uh, from a creator, Malenga Mulindema from Zambia, so it's a story from Lusaka. And this is an image I use to remind myself of who this story represents. Um, it's now changed to Mama K's Team 4. It's a working title. This is what happens in film. We change the titles with league compliance and all of that all the time, so who knows what it'll be in a year's time, but I think this will be it for now. Mama K's Team 4 um, is a TV series that represents these, these faces on the screen. There's a huge gap and a disconnect for young black girls to see themselves on screen and to see themselves represented in a positive way, to see themselves as superheroes, to see themselves at, um, coding and engineering and um, with STEM themes. And once you, I think for all of us, we can agree that if you see yourself represented on screen, you know you can be it. When you see yourself engineering and building gadgets to take on the the, the evil villain, you, will, you believe it and you want to be it. And this is the heart of Mama K's Team 4. Uh, Malenga Mulindema, that's her on the right with her sister on the left. She entered the story lab, the Disney story lab, hey? Just a few years ago. Just a few years ago. Um, and the reason for this was she wanted to see four strong African girls who saved the day in their own fun and crazy way. And she wanted to illustrate that anyone from anywhere can be a superhero. And so this series is a comedy, it's an action, it's fun and frivolous, it's, um, it doesn't have deep, somber African themes. This is a story and a series for seven to 12 year olds. And that's Malenga today, just a little contrast. She's currently in Cape Town working with our writing team. Um, and these are, our, these are the heroes of our show. And I'll pitch it to you quickly. Um, come on. Um, these are the, our team four. And, and basically our girls are navigating high school, everything that comes with high school, and dealing with your peers. Yet they're also very super gifting. So some are agile, some are fast, some are smart at engineering and coding. And, and these girls are selected by Mama K. Now in the African culture, m women, matriarchs, are seen as represented as elders in the community. And in South Africa and, and other countries, Gogo is what we often term these African mamas. Um, and, and you can have an uncle and an auntie that isn't your family, but she's your uncle and your auntie, or she's your Gogo. And so we have Mama Kay, who's this very wise African woman who recruits these girls sees their natural abilities and pulls them onto team four. She's a secret spy, a former secret spy. She's now retired. She has a fruit and veg shop. And under, under, underground the, the fruit and veg shop, she has a secret underground HQ where the, where the girls are taught to, to be supers and to build gadgets and to take on their natural abilities to take on the villains of the city. So it's set in the soccer, and the baddies always have lots of cash. But these girls play into the themes of African ingenuity where their gadgets are brought to life. 
As I've mentioned, it's a Netflix original, and it's proudly the first original African animated series being produced at Triggerfish in Cape Town. One of the other um, things we're very proud of, as I just scroll through, these are old images. We can't release the new images. Sorry about that. But they do give you a glimpse of what to expect. Um, this series would not be authentic and would not be local if we didn't allow the voices to represent that. And what we decided with Netflix was to make sure our budget was not just to produce the series, but to create yet another incubator. And this incubator was called the Writer's Lab. And this Writer's Lab simply, again, identified talent and opportunity and realized that there are no black women writers in the animation space. There is no complete all-woman writing team in the animation space that I'm aware of. Our head writer is the head writer of the Powerpuff Girls and Skunk Fu and po My Little Pony, and she has never written on an all-woman writer's team. I mean, so let's smash um, all the firsts on this series. And so what we did is we pitched a, a, a writer's lab. We got 750 applications from the continent. 25, oh, it was so tough. 25 writers were shortlisted. We chose 12 and we brought them to Lusaka for a, a 10 day intensive script writing workshop for animation, bridging the gap and giving them a sense of what it's like to work in animation. We're hoping those 12 writers will plant the seed of something beautiful in the animation space by pitching their ideas to the likes of many broadcasters and, and um, partners in the future. But we could only choose six, but then we chose eight because we couldn't say goodbye to the other two. So we chose eight, and they represent um, countries in Africa, Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Zambia, and we have one Cape Tonian on the team, yay. And um, and these writers are the voice of the series, guided and shaped by their story editor and head writer in Los Angeles. What we're seeing is skills transfer at the highest level. This series will play internationally and release to 150 countries in two years' time. Sorry, you're going to have to wait. But the idea is that this is an extremely high-quality series, authentically spoken from women on, from the continent, to represent women who've not been represented on the continent to the world. And these are some of our fabulous writers who, um, from our workshop in Lusaka. And what I can, right now we're currently in pre-production and we're, we're writing, this was them on Table Mountain. We're currently writing and we've got 20 episodes to produce and we're currently on script eight and it is funny. Uh, I, I think a lot of people don't think Africans are funny, but it is funny. And, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm so excited to, to have this series released and for the world to experience what we experience. And that's just a little case study of what we've been doing at a local level. I don't take issue with case study, but I take issue with little. Um, just one question. You were very upbeat about the role that the streamers are playing, the uh, uh, subscription VOD services, uh, video on demand services are offering that. They're adding a new possibility inside the value chain. Do you find at the moment this series being set up with Netflix? What do you, how do you see the future for African content in terms of the emergence and consolidation of locally na native platforms? You reference Iroko, which was born to service the, actually to offer uh, uh, Nollywood pictures to the world, and including the African diaspora. Do you see them becoming alternative partners for the content that you're trying to develop? Because in theory, and as a priest to independent producers, I should know, it's always better to have several points of entry than only one or two, right? Yeah. So your question is asking if, the, if there would be other streaming African platforms. Sustainable ones that can also champion your content. I honestly don't think that Not other enough. streaming platforms can be sustainable. I honestly don't know how Netflix are doing it. I'm excited about Disney Plus and, and what content's going to be, original content's going to be created. I honestly think those giants who have got such an appetite for risk are the only ones that can pull it off. I, I, I think Iroko is, in a, is headed for tough times. So I personally think we should be making sure African stories, local stories, go to the world. And let's use the platforms that are, are, are the best platforms for that. So I would say the mix would be linear broadcast, traditional broadcast models. Let's do a film if you must, but let's make sure we have the right partners on board to give it a good budget because um, it's tough out there. And and let's make sure we can make short films in the meantime because what we are seeing is a shortage of women directing, a shortage of women writing in this space, and short films help them create and, and stretch their creativity and mm. try to direct. So my strategy and our studio strategy would be more about spreading it across okay. traditional uh, giant 
you know, Reforms. structures that are set up rather than new ones coming up. All right, thank you. Well, I'm sure you have, you'll have questions for Vanessa. I'm inviting you to write them down and hold them for now. We're just going to roll out the, the, the workshop speakers part of this, if you don't mind. And then we'll leave time at the end for you to engage with our speakers. I'd like to move on to, um, to Sigrun Nice and also to Sarika Lakani. You are a, a team, in fact. One of you is more on the institutional side, the other is a producer. But we'll start with you, Sigrun. I think one of the big yeah. words we heard uh, from Vanessa was gap. Gaps between uh, the, 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 you know, the huge talent in the, in the case of Africa mm -hmm. that exists there and the ability of the uh, infrastructure to enable it to professionalize and to make content that's culturally relevant uh, locally and globally. Why is the Deutsche Welle Academy involved in that space? And what are you trying to achieve? And why is the cooperation ministry supporting you in this endeavor? Yeah, um, yeah thank you very much, Bertrand. Um, I'm not sure if everybody in the room knows what the Deutsche Welle Academy is doing. Um, when the Deutsche Welle Academy is part of the W, the, oh, well, I can do that. Thank you. Green. <laughs> Green. <laughs> um, the Deutsche Welle Academy is, or DW Academy is the um, part of the Deutsche Welle DV, the um, foreign uh, broadcaster from Germany. And we as um, DW Academy, we're doing development cooperation in the sense of media development cooperation. And um, we're the strategic partner of the uh, Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development of Germany. And um, therefore, uh, we're involved in film development and mainly in Africa because uh, Vanessa already said so many important things on um, making local content grow and enabling the industry to grow and as well and education for talent in Africa and um, this is what we are actually doing and helping to supporting in different African countries as um, which is part of the, the Marshall Plan with Africa of the BMZ. Mm -hmm. And um, we are uh, supporting different countries with film. But so why BMZ. film? Yeah, BMZ. sorry, it's the, the ministry. Bundesministerium yes, for exactly. this cooperation. Exactly. Right. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, um, so we're the main strategic partner for media development cooperation and as well in film. And uh, for several years now, we're supporting film projects in different African countries, which Sarika um, is telling more um, about in, yeah, deeply in, in detail because she's the one implementing one of our um, long running projects in Kenya. Um, so what I'm going to tell you more about is more the outer part and the, the framework that we are doing. And um, let me just say that when I'm saying film or when we're talking about film, it doesn't mean that we and our work um, in different African countries is not limited to feature film, but as well to web series or documentary. And um, the main objective is the education. So, and when it comes to film, and oh, <laughs> there's, there went something wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So they're supposed to um, to stand that we're doing, we're having two objectives when it comes to film supporting, um, and the the one thing is to use film as a um, a job creator, or we believe in that that film is a job creator, because um, local film production needs to involve a lot of um, local staff, and a lot of jobs are being needed for a big production, such as Zarika is going to tell about. Mm, and this is what Deutsche Welle Academy is mainly doing in film. We're helping with capacity building of filmmakers and media professionals in all areas, like in all, um, yeah, in all, all jobs which are used for film. Because, uh, and in that way, we're, we're having, um, or we're supporting film in two aspects, as in one way, we are believing that um, film um, should be supported uh, in a way of high quality films, so on international standards, and it helps the industry grow 
to to learn to produce an international standards and um, yeah, to connect and and um, yeah, connect the industry um, to um, a bigger bigger picture, the bigger bigger standards. I'm saying that wrong. Sorry, not the bigger picture. Mm, to the international standards and to help people being ready. Um, for international companies coming in to um, maybe to produce and um, connect to international markets. And the other thing that we are, sorry, this is again wrong, what you see, should see there is um, strengthening the freedom of, uh, the f strengthening the freedom of expression, um, which is the yeah. other um, big pillar of our work of uh, DW Academy. Mm, and what is meant by that, that for example, which is a good picture here, or um, a nice example, is that we're producing, for example, a documentary series on migration, which contains 30 um, different documentaries produced in over 70 countries in, um, in different countries in Africa. And it is about the Pan-African migration, and it enables uh, first of all, producers um, to, to, to raise uh, their voice on their point of view of migration and different point of views and bringing people into dialogue about migration. Mm, and not even, um, and, and this is a very important project because what comes, yeah, what comes, what is always shown or seen on our media, um, or not always, but a lot, is that. Um, the, the migration to Europe, but um, this project shows um, the migration within Africa and pan-African countries. Mm. And this one is, um, yeah, it is also meant for people, uh, for bringing, bringing people into dialogue with each other and showing the different opinions or the different uh, point of, view, of views. Mm. Yeah, it is. Some sorry, something happened to the yeah. <laughs> so this um, sorry, this slide meant to, yeah. I don't know what happened there. Um, this slide meant to to show you that we already did during the last um, years. We already um, um, helped or we already trained over one thousand four hundred filmmakers during the last nine years. And um, this, is, this was in over 20 different African countries, of course, in different projects, and in over 30 productions. So this one was just on the numbers. And maybe <laughs> let's see <laughs> what, yeah, so let's see what we can, oh, this one is quite okay. <laughs> the last one is quite okay, finally. <laughs> Mm, yeah, and this is um, a little bit um, a look into the future because what we're doing now is uh, like we've, we've done the big projects now for for different uh, for several years, um, but as well now we started to have a new um, pilot project in 2018, concentrating on film mm, and, uh, and and film yeah and, and content and supporting content local content. Um, in African countries, and um, so we try to find out what is actually the need, and we're still trying to orientate on that um, what the markets will need. And of course, all of you know that the, the markets are so different, and every market needs some some different um, or something different. And here are two new two projects that we. Um, just raised, uh, just, just just started to work with, and um, those two um, are the one is in Nigeria, and it is about a film school only for women because it was found out that in the um, you all of course know Nollywood and the huge industry of Lagos, but um, as well in, in probably all film industries, there's a lack of women women and filmmakers, women female filmmakers. And as you already stated in your um, wonderful project, here's uh, another example um, of a project where film, female filmmakers are supported. And this is going to be a, a school concentrating on female, fam uh, female filmmakers in Lagos. And um, yeah, 
this is one of our new projects we are going to support hopefully pretty soon. And the other one is um, the TBAP Girls, uh, um, an animation series for primary school girls in um, Ethiopia. And something you already described is being a superhero. Um, and we just started this project um, in Ethiopia with uh, script writing and, uh, no, not script writing, sorry, the, the storyboarding workshops. And it is also about not only of producing the series, but also, of course, producing our um, helping supporting the local filmmakers and the, the local um, Ethiopian creative artist um, to raise their capacity in storyboarding and character design, et cetera, et cetera, what else is needed on the con on, in this context and helping uh, the local studios to grow. Mm. So, and this is what um, we're trying to do with our work at Deutsche Welle Academy is that we're, um, yeah, we're, we're supporting um, on the one hand, what you unfortunately could not read <laughs> is um, that we do always have to, the two legs that we're trying to um, to support the, the industry um, by supporting um, the capacity of filmmakers and media professionals. And the other thing is um, helping to speak up filmmakers and uh, other media professionals by giving them um, a chance or a platform um, to speak up and as well uh, promote their freedom of speech. Yeah. Could I spare you a question for now because I, I mm -hmm. see the two of you as an ensemble, so I, I'd like to move on to you, Sarika. You're this, in a sense the sort of frontline end of this project because you've been involved in making mm. seven feature films in Kenya in the past 11, 11 years. Uh, from having seen some of those, uh, know how they were packaged and financed and distributed, they are very much made to what you loosely call an international quality standard. So that I imagine that the strategy there was to, again, to bridge a gap. It's your reference to capacity building and to make this content, in a sense, uh, enhance its opportunities to access the distribution systems nationally and internationally. Do you want to take us through these? <laughs> so we were founded 11 years ago by um, German, um, um, uh, yeah, a German, a German company who, sorry, sorry. Um, um, we are funded, uh, we were founded by Tom Tikva and his wife Marie Steinmann and the idea was to train African filmmakers um, on uh, making films by making films mm -hmm. and by um, training these filmmakers we found out that there are so many stories um, and so many unique stories and stories which can only come from that part of the world that um, it is once they are given the platform to be seen on the world stage um, it gives a new voice and a, a new opportunities to these filmmakers so that is the core idea um, I'm a filmmaker by profession, at heart, we, we all are, so we have nothing to do with international cooperation or education. I've only attended film schools, I never designed one before. Um, so the idea was really, what, what, what does it take, what do you need in order to learn films? And the truth is, you have to make them in order to, to know how to, <laughs> how to make them. Um, and there's, there was a gap. So we invented our own model um, 11 years ago. And I um, may say that we are the reason why the Ministry for Foreign Development, uh, Cooperation and Development even got into that field. Um, we have produced seven feature films who have been um, successfully shown all over the world. So we screen at the Toronto Film Festival. We win awards in Berlin. Our films have been, um, have had a lot of exposure and to, uh, show you how that looks like when we train how to make films by making films. I brought a little trailer with me. So we need to ship that out. Can you? That's great. And bear with us, we're going online. Funny enough. <laughs> Scary stuff. There's sound. <laughs> Yeah.
Ben ay. Natafta kalai. Tisa ina fai kuendelea. Nisi mtu isa ima. Before we jump back on, on, on this, I suppose a provocative question would be, these look terrific, and I know they are because I've seen some of them. Um, they're excellent for festivals. They would probably do extremely well if they were supported for release in cinemas. They're professionally made. And um, action. You make these, you give the resources for people to make them, and then what? Does anything, what's to leave behind in terms of building capacity from your point of view? So first of all, I might say that I couldn't do that without our partners in Kenya. So we um, are one fine day films based in Berlin, and we have um, um, our partners in crime, as I might call them, mm -hmm. uh, Ginger and Guy Wilson from Ginger Inc. Films in Kenya. And I think it is, uh, and we speak with um, technology that's very possible, um, not only on a daily, but I may say on an hourly basis. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that is exactly a question. So, 11 years ago, obviously, the market and the landscape was a lot different than it is today. So, there, are, there were a lot of people who had great ideas but didn't know how to exactly, what the skill set is even to, what does a, some people know what an actor do, does, some people know what, what a director does, but what does a producer do? And we are, as well, we are about the production designer, the sound person, we are about the editors, we are about the whole, we are training the entire uh, landscape of filmmakers, the craftsmanship. Um, so that is where we were 11 years ago, and now things have um, changed due to our films as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, what we found is that um, it is great that our filmmakers and our films travel to all of these festivals, but then what? Because um, if there is a lack of funding, a lot of a lack of infrastructure, a lack of, I may say so, uh, a policy in place, um, then there are very limited um, ways for the filmmakers, besides our initiative, to make their 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 own films. Mm -hmm. And as I'm a film producer, obviously I am, and we've worked with this great talent. Um, we want to see them flow and nourish, and we want to, you know, do more projects with them. Um, so one of the things we got involved in three years ago was um, creating a tax incentive for Kenya because, as I said earlier, there is no film. Unlike uh, South Africa, there is no there is no film fund in place. There is no tax incentive in place. There is absolutely no. Um, Support. Uh, uh, support is a big word, <laughs> but um, there, there are no substantial uh, policies in place where you, as a Kenyan or international producer who wants to uh, produce a film from that part of the region, can go to an international market because the first question would always be, what are you bringing with you from your own country? And then you can say, yeah, a network and maybe a helicopter shot or maybe I know some people and they will do that for free. But that's not something you can put in a financing plan. And in order to be taken serious on the international um, um, film, film market, and I just want to point one thing out, the beauty about film is that it can travel very easily. So unlike any other products, unlike, let's say, agricultural products or um, whatever, industries, um, film is something Yes, it takes some time to make it, but once it's ready, it can easily be distributed um, so without further regulations unless there's censorship, but it's, it's a very, it can be a very fast traveling and, and fast earning um, um, project, product. 
So what we have found is this gap in policy, and we were wondering how can, how can we support the local filmmakers closing that by demanding um, and, and making it visible that there is this need for a change in the government on how they acknowledge their creative industries. Thank you. I mean, uh, if I may put in my two cents worth, in, in the television space that I know in Kenya, uh, thinking about the women I spoke to at uh, Spielworks Media, which is a mid-sized television drama company, the dilemma is very acute because, in a way, in order to sell a concept or a soap opera, uh, a long-running uh, half-hour you know, drama series that appears in the prime time, they, there is so little capability with local broadcasters or willingness, political willingness sometimes, to actually acquire local content at a price compatible with the cost of production that very often they have to go through net MNET in South Africa hoping to get a license fee from them, and then sell to their own domestic broadcasters as a secondary sale. So I think it's a measure of the gap and the, the journey to a degree of economic sustainability for a lot of people who are trying to make a living uh, with those, those products. Um, I'd like to, um, maybe I should leave, I have, I have plenty of other questions, I'm sure others will, but I'd like to move us on now to the music sector and <coughs> reintroduce uh, Santiago Schuster Vergara, who's going to talk to you about adaptive strategies that Chilean and Latin American um, songwriters, singers, and bands have adapted, adopted in order to insert their repertoire into the, uh, the broadband networks that are today are absolutely the cent centrality of the marketplace for, uh, for music. So over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation, and Bertrand. And uh, uh, before to, to talk about my personal experience in the promotion of local content, I would like to say that uh, inclusion is a very sensitive word today in Latin America, and especially in my country. Maybe you have known that uh, in the last week in my country, we have very big protest, and violent protest. And it is not, the reason why is not because we have a bad economy, because the Chilean economy in the context of Latin America is one of the most success economy in macroeconomical figures. But the problem is inclusion. Because the opposite of inclusion is discrimination, is marginal, marginalization, and of course is poverty in participation. And when I wish to talk about inclusion, I would like to say that for us, inclusion is not a secure success in dissemination of local content but it is a way of to get opportunities for all of the musicians, composers, artists, performers, not only the success composer, but of course the unknown composers, not only for the young people who uh, are musicians, but to the old musicians also. And then uh, for that reason, uh, I think that when we are discussing about inclusion, participation is the right word that we have to use. Um, and then my experience as a CEO in an author society for a long time, a musician society, uh, I have some experience that I would like to share with you. Um, and the title of my presentation is a small venues for big audience. Why? Because sometimes we think that in the digital network, we need big infrastructure for disseminate, for the dissemination of, uh, of our local content. I, I think we need to be creative also in the ways, in, in discovering the ways of 
promoting our uh, content. Um, in regard to audiovisual and music, maybe we have a difference. Because in music today, we don't have a problem with the production of the music. Audiovisual, I understand that you need to put big uh, effort on financial uh, effort in, in producing uh, uh, audiovisual work. But in music, you have today a huge musical offer in, in the network. The problem of music dissemination, of local content musical dissemination, is visibility. It's difficult for the musicians today to be part of the uh, network uh, with some visibility. And then, uh, in my experience, we have, uh, I would like to share some, some experience that uh, it is not a big success, but it is uh, a way to find a new model of local dissemination, local inclusion. So sorry, it's not my computer. <laughs> Thank you. The first one is uh, small SCD concert halls. SCD is the Chilean, um, is the Chilean music um, organization for, uh, uh, for, for collective management activities. It's licensing the music. And uh, small SCD concert halls are uh, a project that has uh, four small uh, concert halls in Santiago, our capital, and in Valparaíso. They are not big halls. They are only uh, they only have around uh, 100 and to uh, 300 seats. That's all. But what it's interesting is that. They present day by day uh, uh, Chilean musicians with uh, different kind of music. And, uh, but they use this concert for some, uh, uh, some uh, kind of promotion in the network, in the digital network. For example, in a year, in 2019, they have presented 412 concerts in those halls. It means one, 1 thousand and half uh, 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 concerts, uh, sorry, artists on, on stage. And uh, those concerts have been uh, produced as audiovisual and in the website of the uh, Salas SSD, there are 629 concerts uh, produced as audiovisual. That is a very important thing for the composer and Chilean musicians because it means that they have a window to show their works. And then the small audience of 100 or 200 people, it expanded to the digital network in YouTube. That is the case of those uh, 629 concerts. The second example is the blue label, is Sello Azul in Spanish, and Oveja Negra, black ship label. Two um, independent um, recording label that uh, was founded by the same authors uh, and musicians, Chilean authors and musicians in, in, in my country. Why they funded that, this, this kind of uh, enterprises? It's only because in the late 90s, um, the majors, the big companies, abandoned the local musicians because they had to reduce cost and the first thing that they did as a measure for, uh, to, to improve their economy was to, uh, to cut the cost in local content. 
And the author society started with those kind of, uh, of uh, recording companies. And it was, a, in this case, it was a very big success. Because in 2010, these two companies had the most uh, high amount of launched uh, uh, of musical albums launched in Latin America. And uh, it means that uh, they, uh, they produced more than 200 um, albums. Uh, it was the first uh, recording company in Latin America in national launching, in, Latin, in, in, in national production. And uh, this project has today 18 years. And it's interesting also to understand that, of course, the musical industry crisis uh, end in a new model of business. And now, these uh, national companies move to a new model of uh, business model, which is to not to support directly to the local group, but to support the local or the national independent companies. And today, this project is moving to a new stage, a new phase of, of production with, uh, with success. The third project is an Uruguayan project. It is uh, Authors Bro Broadcasting Life. It's similar, but with some difference. It's similar because the Uruguayan uh, Author Society has also a small um, concert call for 200 seats. And what they, they are doing is to uh, produce audiovisual in live concert in this concert hall. Um, uh, and immediately, they upload the concert, but also they disseminate the concert in TV paid with an agreement with a very important TV cable in Montevideo. It is interesting because the Uruguayan repertoire uh, respond to the needs of uh, a small country. It's only three million and uh, uh, half, uh, uh, half million people. For that reason, this project is very, uh, very useful for the Uruguayan composer. Um, they have had 180 um, concerts in a year, and uh, in the YouTube channel, they have 22 million visits. Uh, and the project uh, had today 10 years uh, surviving in this complex context of uh, music dissemination. The, the fourth, uh, it is a very important one because it's a project of what I call the new publishers in the industry. I think that uh, many people and many young people who work with musicians as promoter, as agent, or uh, simply uh, of the the, 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 the people who, who help the, the musicians in disseminate their work are the real new publishers in the 21st century. The old concept of uh, a financial publisher, uh, I think, is, uh, is an obsolete concept for this new stage, new phase of musical or local musical dissemination. What, what does mean? That the, it, it is important that uh, those people who are involved in musical work, not, not as a composer or, or a musician, but as a content agent, has to be involved in the value change of the music. Um, this, is the pro this project is, uh, uh, is the festival, the Fluvia Festival. Uh, it's organized in a small city in the south of Chile, Valdivia. And uh, it meet um, around uh, 200 of, uh, of young producers 
uh, not only from Chile, but from other countries. They, they exchange experience and they have, they have a round uh, business. And uh, it is indeed a very interesting um, experience that I, um, I, 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 okay, <laughs> that is, uh, time is gone again. And, uh, and, and as, as you can see in this, uh, in this picture, they have had, uh, uh, well, they, they gathered 260 professionals in music uh, and uh, with uh, 11,000 people attending the, the, um, the, the festival. And I think this is the, a new way of uh, dissemination of, of local content. And, and then, finally, what, uh, what I would like to, to say is uh, uh, the new times need new ways of uh, conduct the musical business, not only thinking in majors, in the majors, but in independent producers and, uh, and small places for big audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think we are, we've got <coughs> a little less than 19 minutes left. <laughs> thank you so much for being so uh, disciplined about it. And I, I'm sure I have tons of questions that I'd like to ask, but I want to give a chance to people in the room to interact with you now, maybe make uh, uh, come back to you about some of the things they heard. So who would like to kick that off? No, don't be shy. Shane. So thank you for the presentation. I want to go leave now and watch all the shows that you just showed that was amazing and listen to the music. Um, so can you give us some ideas as far as you know promoting local content? How has the internet been helpful? And then if you have any kind of concerns about what the internet has done to maybe not protect your products. I can give a little example. In 2011, when we produced Nairobi Half-Life, um, which is up until today Kenya's most successful feature film, um, we were overthrown by the demand. I, I mean, no feature film has made Kenyans run to the cinema. And this, the film was in Kenyan cinemas for six months straight. Oh. Uh, we outlived Bond. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, there was, we, we, we weren't prepared for that at all. No one was. No one had anticipated that something like that could happen. And obviously, we also found our film on the internet. And then in, in those days, you found, we, we found ourselves within the discussion of making the film accessible and, and for people to watch. And on the other hand, the rights holders who, this is not a hobby what we do as creatives, this has to make you know, ends meet and bring food to the table. Um, so we find ourselves in a discussion where we thought, okay, what do we do now? Because obviously there is no infrastructure in place. And as usual, um, that's not, not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a gap for opportunities. And what can this opportunity be? And we, this gap is now automatically filling itself with uh, the likes of Netflix because piracy is not the hot shit anymore. I mean, in, uh, 10 years ago, people were actually telling me that it's a good thing that people pirate our film because that way it's public, you know, it's in the public domain, it should belong to everyone and everyone should be able to watch our film for free. And it's like, you find yourself in a discussion with people who have no sense of understanding of what rights are and that these rights are generated, you know. Other people go eight hours to work and get paid by the hour, and we generate rights, which is our, our the currency we are dealing in. So the internet, the internet in the beginning was quite a challenge, I would say, and now with the, with the streamers is filling that gap, because also what, what we have to put into perspective is that um, how much does, does content cost? And I want to say that for Kenya and for East Africa, people for a very long time were under the impression that content doesn't have to cost anything because it's brought to them for free or it's on telly or it's, you know, music. Everything was like kind of, you know, you, you accept it and it's, it, it's socially accepted to be, a pirate, to, be a, to be a pirate and to raise the awareness that, no, this is a 
something you should pay for. Um, I must say that the likes of Netflix has helped us because people, it's, it's affordable, so middle class people can pay for it. Um, and it has and it has made it more easy to to access the content. Uh, by the way, I don't only want to say uh, uh, Netflix. Actually, what is more affordable, Showmax. <laughs> so, so and Showmax being the um, uh, the, the VOD South service Africa. from Mnet in South Africa. And yeah. they're currently on offer in Kenya, I think, for three hundred bob a month. So it's a, about three dollars per month, and our film screen there, and now no one can really tell me that they can't afford. If they want to watch our film, I can tell them this is where you can. Because don't forget, we are film producers, we are content producers. I'm not a marketing expert. I know everyone is trying to tell me I should, but honestly, I can't be good at everything. I'm good at I'm, I'm, I'm good at something else. I'm not a good at marketing. I'm not necessarily good at distribution. I have a sense for the business. But I think there are other people who are good at that, and we need strong partners in that field. You may have something to add. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. Um, I can remember flashbacks to Zambesia, and there's this, there's this point in, in filmmaking where the film goes to post-production, and... It, everything is quite precious, and, and before it's released, nobody can actually share anything about the film. It's the same in animation, um, where no visuals can be released. It's all hush-hush until it's um, released online and in, in the media, and then you can have, I worked on that film. Um, but I remember on Zambezia, we, we were able to we were able to trace that their film was um, pirated from our Russian post producer, the distributor and, and in Russia, and it was quite a shock at the point where it basically cut your, your cinematic box office dramatically because now it's available online. And um, and we, we felt so unprotected in that space, and I think as filmmakers, specifically with the theatrical cinematic business model, you feel so exposed because you have no leverage as a creator in that space to demand what is yours as box office revenue. And so, um, coupled with it being pirated and you don't have revenue at all. So it's, it's very scary territory, And um, but that is 10 years ago. Um, what I can say is that we've really loved that we could put a lot of short films and a lot of tutorials and online um, training materials online. We, we recently had a webcast last year for African creators where we, we, we figured out through a survey what they would like training on and we had experts in those fields all in the studio our studio in Cape Town and we just uh, did a webcast live and I love that about the internet and I love that we can have materials available online but when it comes to your bread and butter it's really it's home because you're then able to not recoup and therefore not able to invest in a new film um, as a studio just to be completely honest we have a gaming division which does mostly service work for big international North American companies studios and it's pure service work 20 artists but it really does fund our development division that doesn't have revenue and so that's just a picture of how tough it is to create world-class material and that it needs to be funded because it doesn't developing and writing and, and creating art um, can't fund itself in development stages. So you need to be able to cover those expenses to be the best, to have the best scripts, to be, have the best pictures. Um, so it, it really, yeah, it, it's tough, tough out there. Just to clarify, your development division is the one that's working at a potential loss, developing new ideas, new visual concepts, identifying yeah. new writers, commissioning scripts all of which you have to engage at risk without knowing whether the film's going to may be made or not. Exactly that. Um, as Sarika mentioned, unless you're actually filming, you don't know, you don't have the skills, you need to create, you need the space and the freedom to create. And as policymakers, as private sector and government sector, if I would definitely, one of the things I'd love to highlight in this session is that if you, if you back your creators and you back them having opportunity to create, you will see your investment come to, to fruition. And yes, you won't see returns on that necessarily, but you need to wait it out as a long-term uh, vision, not a short-term return, short -term return. So spot-on development for us is we'll, we'll currently have 10 projects in development, all different stages, writing, artwork, and we hope to pitch it around whenever we can. 
Thank you for that, both of you. Let's have the next question. Can you tell, tell us who you are? Uh, yes, hello, I'm uh, Vladimir Cortez from Article 19 uh, from the office in Mexico and Central America. Uh, I was like wondering if, uh, if you can like uh, tell us and wh whoever wants to, to pick up like uh, a series of reflections and, and questions, like when you are like uh, doing this and conducting these uh, processes uh, from Deutsche Welle Academy, from like uh, uh, one uh, fine night films and and so on. Uh, if you are like uh, facing first like some challenges in terms of uh, like uh, skills appropriations in in filmmaking, in technology, or uh, in the language of the of, of cinema and and so on, and if you also uh, somehow like face this like uh, challenges also in terms of, of language if if when we are like thinking on content uh, production on local content if if there is also like this kind of approach uh, on the community on the things that happens there on their own language on their own customs on the things that they're like uh, uh, like living uh, living there and uh, how it's like also like this this process and how it's like then being reflected in the uh, in the film and in the stories that uh, people is uh, uh, is telling, and and finally, if uh, I understand, like there is a, a process on on filmmaking and like uh, it, it evolves and it, uh, uh, like different aspects and different actors and, and many things, but if there is also like a consideration in terms of like at some point these uh, films and this thing that that people is, is is creating that communities are creating that women are are creating if uh, you are considering at some point like uh, using creative commons licenses or if there is a way of spreading it more i know that now uh, technology and different platforms allows uh, and it's like more accessible to people but at some point like uh, thinking on another ways of licensing and uh, and like opening to can to i this. trans sum up because there's five questions you said uh, tech. yes sorry can, for can that I was just like no, uh, many that? things that <laughs> but can you give us the distillation with the four very quickly Who, very yeah quickly. just like whoever wants to yeah. just like it, it was like something that I was like uh, now th uh, thinking about so and and basically like like how 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 each one it's like living this kind of, of, of so process. you said technical skills language um, help me out. Uh, creative and the third one alternative is alternative forms of licensing. Yeah, that's yeah. that's, that's, three, that's, that's pretty three. good. Who wants yeah. to take this? Okay, I'll start about the language thing, um, and not language in terms of English, German, Swahili, and but in terms of culture. I guess was your question hinting or pointing to. So, if I give you a personal background, I come from a Indian, Kenyan, German intercultural relationship. <laughs> so I grew up in a household um, where none of that was ever addressed, but it was by the mere fact that it was like that, like that. <laughs> so for me, the question of... Just to make sense, yes. you're Kenyan of Indian descent? Yes, my father is German. Indian Kenyan, my mom's German. That's it. Yes. And I have two siblings, and my kids are half Kenyan, so <laughs> to complicate that. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, so, because we get that question a lot, and I can actually not give you a very sensible answer to that, because um, I think if you come from a point where you meet on a, as filmmakers, and there is a universal language in film, just as there is a universal language in art, um, which and between us all as humans, so um, of course there are some cultural differences um, sometimes to bridge, which mm, because I come from a household, I don't always understand the differences. Be, be <laughs> but as long as we speak, as long as we interact, as long as we, we meet as filmmakers, and I think actually it's very helpful that we have something to do um, in our environment, because we all know we all come together in order to make a film. So. Even if we get stuck in these cultural uh, uh, differences, at the end, we still have to produce that damn film. <laughs> so we have to find a solution for it. And I think that is extremely helpful because it's a very practical, it's a very practical uh, um, task ahead, just like in, in, in my childhood. We, we are a family. We have to live as a family, whether we like it or not. And um, in the terms of, I don't know whether your question also hinted to authenticity, but because stories can, stories 
in order to be authentic, they have to be told from where they come from. And they can only do that um, if they do come from there. And then there are some skills which are internationally or universally working and we are trying, and I think we've become fairly good at that. So identifying local talent of artists who have something to say and then matching them um, with international professionals who know how that could possibly put, put into uh, a streamlined. Your suite of questions was so plentiful that I think all our panelists <laughs> wants to answer. We I have just, about five minutes left. Yeah. I just, just wanted to, to add concerning the technical, because you had a technical question mm -hmm. inside there as well. And um, we are always trying to, and the work at Deutsche Welle Academy and with our partners together, to find the, if possible, local experts mm -hmm. to involve into the project. Sometimes it is not possible, um, and so as Zarika already told that you're working with international experts, but of course it's always uh, the goal and the aim to find the local experts to bring them into the project and bring them together. Thank you for this. I think you wanted to come in. Oh, it's only to, to add something, but mm -hmm. from the side of music, sure. that uh, yes, uh, um, well, the option of Creative Commons license is one option in the framework of copyright also. And then um, in, 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 in the case of, uh, of the, the, the reality in Chile that I know, uh, is uh, the author, the composer is, 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 has, has the, the freedom to, to elect one system or the other system. Um, and um, I think there is no conflict between a, 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 a license by a royalty or a license by, by or through Creative Commons uh, license. In, the, in, in Chile, which is the country that, or the reality that I know uh, with more, um, more accurate, um, some authors license through the system of uh, the, the common system of copyright, and the other elect for other works to license through uh, Creative Commons. Uh, they are free for that, and, uh, and it depends on the election of, of the author. Thank you very much, and I'm afraid this is kind of all the time we have, because I'm conscious that we have a very quick turnaround for the next workshop to be set up. I don't want to put our marvelous technicians under more stress than they've already experienced during that uh, forum. And thank you very much for your assistance. Um, I hope this has been helpful. As I said at the beginning, this is a workshop. It was about imparting information about how the professional content industries in two uh, headline creative industries work, music and audiovisual. And I hope we've, these people have managed to give you a glimpse of the sort of uh, issues they face in their daily practice. I think one of the things that strikes me, amongst many other things in what you said, is there is no, there are very porous boundaries between local and global. And that in a sense with, the, especially in audiovisual, where the investment uh, intensity attached to making anything is so high, the desire to globalize a story is very powerful, also because stories want to travel uh, as a natural kind of dynamics. And that what I find is also that this needn't mean that you bastardize the cultural integrity of the story you're telling, quite the opposite, that you can actually think local but act global in this sense as well. And in that sense, what I heard is at this point, uh, it may not be a love affair, but you find that the insertion of online services in the value chain is proving to be a very helpful, uh, a helpful development. Uh, I think we, we would need more time to discuss the ins and outs of this. And thank you also, Santiago, for suggesting how certain solutions are being found at grassroots level to insert the repertoire of Latin American um, musicians. So that's all we've got time for. There'll be a, a report in the session. I forgot to introduce our rapporteur, Matthias Schwartz. Thank, thank you. you so much. And uh, it remains for me to thank every one of you for coming and to encourage you to give a big hand to, um, to Sarika 
to, to Vanessa, to Sigrun, and uh, to Santiago, and also to our, our partners, WIPO, <coughs> the, uh, the German uh, Production Alliance. Sorry, my voice is already going. And uh, did I forget you? The Deutsche Welle Academy. Thank you so very much for coming. Thank you. Check, check, check. 